Hi, I'm Kristen Savelle, Executive Director at the Rock Center for Corporate Governance at Stanford. Welcome to Rock Center Shorts. I'm very pleased to introduce today's guest speaker. James Williams is a partner at DLA Piper, who has extensive experience navigating the intersection of corporate securities and intellectual property law in Web3 and crypto content transactions. And he has represented dozens of DAOs from around the world. Welcome, James. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you. Nice to have you. Today, we're going to talk about a decision that was recently issued in a putative class action against BZX DAO and its successor, Uki DAO, that could have significant implications for the future of DAOs. But let's start with a little bit of background. So, James, can you tell us what is BZX and what were the circumstances that gave rise to the lawsuit? Sure. So BZX was originally, and it still is, um, just a cryptocurrency protocol that allows for users to engage and, and margin trade on the pro protocol. And initially, it was developed by a dev team, which is also a named defendant, um, and it was a standalone protocol. Uh, but in 2021, in August of 2021, the dev team handed the protocol over to a DAO, which was named BZX DAO, and later changed its name, as you mentioned, to Uki DAO. And the uh, the genesis of the lawsuit is that um, it's a single single cause of action for negligence, and that is that uh, a, a $55 million hack occurred uh, when the protocol, after the protocol was transferred to the DAO. And uh, the, the putative class members represent about 1.7 million of, of losses um, on the DAO due the, to, the, to the hack. Okay, great. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the defendants to the action? So the, the defense to the action is, um, or, or the defendants? Yeah, who are the named defendants? You mentioned uh, the DAOs. So, so the, I mean, for purposes of governance, uh, I mean, I think the most interesting defendant is the DAO itself, and by extension, um, based on the pleadings and this order, all of the token holders at the time of the hack are are, are essentially defendants, along with different elements of the dev team and uh, security and protocol developers of the DAO at different points of time. Right. Um, and just to clarify, because it is important for purposes of our discussion today, BZX DAO had no formal legal structure at the time of the hack or the lawsuit. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So tell us on, on what basis is this lawsuit predicated? If we're talking about a bunch of just individual members of a DAO, what is the basis for liability there? So the basis argued in this suit is that the DAO was an unincorporated general partnership. And uh, the, the defendants sought to dismiss that claim. Um, and the court, you know, the, the whole point of the order is the court uh, disagreed with, with that defense and um, held that uh, the, the plaintiffs sufficiently pled the existence of a partnership. It's not really a surprise to to practitioners um, in the space. You know, we've been advising clients that unwrapped DAOs face the potential uh, for being deemed a general partnership because of the the low bar, really, uh, to plead those elements. I want to dig into this partnership question a little bit more. And you mentioned the decision, and just to back up a little bit. Uh, last summer, several defendants, excluding the DAOs, actually moved to dismiss the complaint on a number of grounds. Um, the partnership issue was one of the uh, arguments that the defendants raised in their motion to dismiss. But can you tell us a little bit more about that argument? What, what were defendants claiming in the motion to dismiss with regard to the partnership? Right. So they were the defendants were were focusing on two of the three elements for a partnership. And the three elements are an association of two or more persons um, carrying on as co-owners of a business for profit. Those are the three elements. And and the two primary arguments the defendants uh, made essentially, number one, was that 
the types of decisions that DAO members were in a were were essentially allowed to to vote on or propose was not sufficiently broad enough to um, it, it be construed as uh, as um, kind of any imputed partnership relationship. So, in, in essence, token holders were only allowed to vote on a narrow parameter of different types of proposals, and they had to go through a number of steps. Uh, to even have those proposals heard. So number one, that that doesn't really constitute carrying on business as a co-owner. And number two, uh, th the defense pled, interestingly, that the DAO was not set up and it is not set up to distribute profits. And uh, for that reason, it, it shouldn't be deemed a partnership. And the judge actually, uh, the, the, the plaintiffs and the judge um, on both counts, um, disagreed with defense, number one, saying that, well, a limited number of governance rights is sufficient to uh, establish a partnership, number one. And number two, uh, on the profit issue, twofold. Number one, the, the plaintiffs and the judge basically stated that the, in theory, the Dow could be reformed to provide a liquidation of the treasury such that token holders received a pro rata interest. And number two, even aside from that, the judge basically uh, stated that that profits distribution in and of itself is not dispositive of the issue. And if uh, other issues of partnership, other elements are sufficient, then um, it's it's Profit distribution is only evidence of a partnership. It's not a requirement. Interestingly, some of the named plaintiffs and putative class members may also be defendants to the action if it turns out that they held some of the DAO governance tokens at the time of the hack. How did the court address that potential conflict of interest? Uh, so, it kind of sidestepped that question by by holding that there was no conflict or sufficient irreconcilable conflict of interest at this stage, at least, um, at this stage uh, of, of the case. And it, it was um, essentially the court stating that the defendants didn't plea, uh, didn't prove a negative. So the, the I would say on a technical basis, the pleading withstood that allegation for conflict of interest because the pleading as strictly read, could be construed to suggest that the 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 lead plaintiffs had no governance tokens, although it's unclear. Got it. And so discovery could prove otherwise. Exactly. In the motion to dismiss, defendants also argued that the complaint failed to allege facts sufficient to establish the duty and breach elements of a negligence claim. Did the court agree? Uh, the court didn't agree, and this is where uh, some of the court's opinion, you know, creates some ripple effects uh, for trans, you know, for for practitioners on the transactional side. So, the judge could have just held that by nature of the fact that they that the plaintiffs have have adequately pled a partnership, that there was an implied duty of care uh, because of the, the existence of a partnership and the duty of care that partners owe to one another in the partnership. The judge went beyond that to address specifically duty of care of the developers and um, discussed a case, an earlier case that involved a cryptocurrency platform and the, the California case was Fabian. I don't I don't have this, the citation off the top of my head. The court did reference it. Uh, in that case, it was not a DAO. It was just a cryptocurrency platform and token holders, had, had, the, the platform had suffered a breach. Token holders had lost funds. And in pleading negligence, the Fabian court held that a special relationship existed for a number of reasons, but one of the key reasons was that the platform itself was custodial. It held the customer's cryptocurrency in platform wallets. The defendants in this case uh, argued pretty strongly that the DAO is non-custodial 
and that by that reason alone, no special relationship exists. The court looked past that and essentially said the fact that the developers retain the private keys to, to upgradable smart contracts essentially allow the developers um, to, to engage with wallets in a way that, that creates the same kind of nexus a custodial uh, platform does. So the worry that we have is that that kind of logic has a certain contagion and starts to spread beyond just this duty of care issue. And specifically in my work that that kind of um, control imputation around developers retaining private keys, which is normally a good thing and, and, and necessary for security reasons, that starts to get unraveled and unpacked in terms of decentralization questions and, and whether you know, a developer holding private keys is an active party in, in the eyes of the SEC. I know it's a little bit off topic, but it's it's an important point. No, interesting. Um, I want to just try and synthesize what I'm hearing from you in terms of the court's ruling, just going back to this partnership question. You tell me if this is a fair interpretation of the decision. Is it correct to say that based on the court's reasoning, any member of a DAO who holds a governance token could potentially be held joint and severally liable for negligence unless there is some structure in place to limit that liability. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. Uh, this ruling was in response to a motion to dismiss. And as you know, the purpose of a motion to dismiss is to test the sufficiency of the complaint, not to decide whether the defendants were actually negligent under the particular circumstances of this case. But based on the reasoning of the court's decision, do you expect that the court will come to a different or the same conclusion on the partnership question if and when it rules on the merits? I don't, I personally don't expect any change on the partnership question. I think, uh, again, it's a pretty low bar in California and most states. And the the practical issue from, you know, from a kind of access to justice question is what's the alternative? If it's not a partnership, then, you know, I, I know some in the community would advocate that it's just software and it's essentially immune from prosecution. Uh, but again, when you have software that's, you know, coordinated by, you know, on, a, on an enterprise level by disparate groups of people and millions or tens of millions of dollars are at stake, um, you know, the, it, the program, the protocol has got to be subject. Um, to, to something. So, so it, it, it almost becomes a question of if not a partnership, then, then how do you access justice, not even on a regulatory issue, but in terms of just civil access to courts? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, since we're talking about justice, even if there is an award of damages here, how would that actually be enforced in practice? We're talking about an unknown number of down members living potentially all over the world, some of whom are entirely anonymous. It's a, that's a problem. That's a real problem. Um, and that's, it's an, it's an issue that, that kind of we have to address again on the transactional side with dev teams. Um, and it's, and it's one of the arguments in our toolkit as lawyers for advocating on behalf of wrapping is that if you don't wrap as a dev team, if you're known, if you're a known entity, you're the lightning rod for this kind of prosecution. So, you know, we may say you know, there's a lot of buzz around, uh, you know, joint several liability. But again, if if all you have is an Ethereum wallet, you're going to go after the known the known entity, which is usually the dev teams. Mm -hmm. How do you see this decision impacting DAOs in the short term? You mentioned wrapping there. So do you anticipate that in response to the decision, many DAOs that had originally opted not to register as an LLC or some legal entity will ultimately decide to adopt some form of structure as a basis for limiting liability? Do you anticipate participation in DAOs to decline drastically for fear of liability? 
We have we haven't seen participation declining. Uh, we have seen in the past year or so, and especially in the past six months, a definite softening in terms of the dev teams accepting the idea of wrapping. the The issue is in the United States, it's it's a it's a combination of securities and entity issue, and they're and they're closely intertwined. And the reality is, for network and protocol DAOs. LL, you can't you can't use a corporation. LLCs are not really viable because they create securities risk. So you're left going offshore. So it becomes an expensive proposition. Um, and and even with offshore foundations, they're not great fits for a lot of DAOs. So I I I think that that issue, that decision point is is definitely shifted. Um, it's rare nowadays that we have a dev team come to us and demand not to be wrapped. That that kind of used to be the 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 common situation about a year ago, eighteen months ago. Not not so much anymore. Okay, interesting. How do you see the decision impacting DAOs in the long term? Do you see a path forward for DAOs, or do you think they fizzle out as a failed experiment in governance? Last I, yeah, so I think there's some really exciting things happening happening with what I would call non-traditional DAOs that are going to push the bounds of governance. We see um, global brands, global enterprises creating consortium DAO consortiums, and and managing you know global governance and and decisions through you know self-executing smart contracts and protocols. We see. Um, you know, global brands launching DAOs that are, you know, partially kind of autonomous that are doing interesting things, but um, kind of the original thesis of the DAO, which is, you know, a network or protocol of disparate individuals interacting, unless we can get some legislation, it's it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to continue to be a challenge in the United States, at least, because our entities, our wrappers really are not a great fit. For that for that kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, James, for sharing your time and insights with us today. We'll have to check back in with you sometime down the road and see how things are evolving. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. Have a wonderful day.